everyone. Glad to welcome each of you here on this new year. I saw most of you last year, and I'm glad to see you again this year. We're looking forward to a great time. I don't feel a year older. I don't know if you do or not, but you're, you're as old as you feel, they say. So uh, I hope and pray that you'll feel, feel well and be well. We're glad to welcome each of you here. We have folks visiting from all over. Uh, folks from Florida and uh, around different counties here in Pennsylvania. We're glad you're here wherever you're from. Also good to have uh, our online church here this morning. And if you could, uh, in the comment section uh, there on Facebook, let us know where you're watching from. That's always helpful encouragement to our uh, video people. Also, if you're a uh, guest this morning, if you would fill out one of our connection cards, they're back on the back table. Uh, we have nice gift bags we'd like to give to our uh, guests. I'm going to ask the praise team to come, and uh, we'll get started as we worship the Lord together, singing a great worship song, Arise, King of Kings. Let's stand together, please, if you're able to, and sing this great song of worship and praise to the Lord.
Thank you very much. You may be seated. Well, I want to thank you for your prayers uh, for us. Those of you who knew about the funeral that I did on uh, Thursday uh, for Inga Reitler, one of our dear faithful church members, 91 years young. Uh, God promoted her to glory on uh, the 26th, Sunday morning after Christmas at 2 a.m., and we were privileged to have her service uh, on Thursday. Her daughter, R Laura Reitler, is here this morning, and uh, we had that service, as I said, Thursday up in Pillow, Pennsylvania, and praise the Lord, we had seven people that accepted the Lord as their Savior, so we thank the Lord for that. Uh, it's always a privilege for me. I don't enjoy... Uh, and I have to watch how I say this because people misunderstand, but I'll try to say it anyway and make it plain. I don't enjoy funerals, doing funerals, um, because I have to bury my friends, most of the people I know. And that's hard. Uh, so I, I don't enjoy it, but I do, I do appreciate the opportunity to preach the gospel, see, and to share, to share the word of God uh, at that time, because sadly, many people will come to a funeral service and never darken the door of a church. They'll just go to a funeral service because out of respect for the family or the, the person that's passed away. And so it's a great opportunity to preach the gospel. And I, I do that all the time. Uh, in fact, if they ask, if some, if they call me sometime to do a service for somebody that I don't know, which happens frequently, and those are easier than you know your friends, uh, I will say to them uh, that I can do that. I don't mind, but you need to tell the family that all I do is I preach the Bible, I preach a gospel message. So if that's acceptable, I'll be happy to serve the family. If they don't want that, then there's probably lots of other people they could find who could give something else. See, I don't, there's nothing else I could give. If I couldn't give God's word, I don't have anything to give people, you know. So I, I appreciate your prayers, and uh, God's good all the time, of course. And uh, many people have had a, a difficult time through these holidays, uh, as lots of folks have either lost loved ones or they have had uh, memories of loved ones that have passed away at this time of the year. And um, we extend all those folks our, our love and sympathies. Uh, and I'm going to be going to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. I want to thank you for giving uh, very generously. Our special Christmas missionary offering, it's listed in your bulletin. I don't know if you read these or not, but uh, our, our faithful office uh, person works hard to get this thing together each week for you. And even noted, how many of you noticed the different colored front? Anybody notice that? Oh, good. A few people noticed. That's good. The reason I say that kind of cynically is because uh, this stuff's, uh, we put announcements in here, you know, and then later on somebody complains and says, hey, I didn't know anything about such and such. And I say, well, it was in the bulletin for six weeks. Oh, I don't read the bulletin. That's fine, whatever, okay, whatever works. That's why, by the way, if you want people to know about an event you're having, you got to tell them five different ways, and then some people still won't know, but that's, that's the rule, okay? So that's why we have it here, we have it on the PowerPoint announcements, we have it on the TV out there, and in the e-bulletin. By the way, if you don't get that e-bulletin and you want to get it, we try not to send it to people who haven't asked for it, but if you'd like to get it, whether you're here in town or out of town, whatever, just give us your email address and say, send me the e-bulletin. Every Wednesday it goes out, and it usually has in prayer requests and praise items, and then we also include what the sermon's going to be the coming Sunday, and uh, we'll send that out each week. So if you'd like to get that, just put the, write that your email address down on something and put it in the collection plate back there. Uh, and we appreciate those people who gave. We continue to meet the needs of uh, the church family, 
And in addition, you gave to the missionaries, over and above everything else, $7,045. And that allowed us then to send uh, special checks to the missionaries, to the six families of $1,006.45. So give yourselves a hand. I think that's great. That, you, especially, you know, with everything else that's going on and uh, God's, God's uh, very, very... Uh, generous with his people and I thank you for for your generosity and listening uh, to the Lord we also had some funds given toward the paving project we're going to have to repave not, not repave but actually put the top coat on the parking lot um, in the spring as soon as it clears up of course you could do it today as hot as it is out there but uh, you know we, we need about Anywhere between thirty-five and forty-five thousand dollars, three thousand more came in, so we're up to thirteen thousand now on the uh, on that parking lot project. So thank you, and I'm not begging for money here. I'm just trying to update you and tell you what what we have received. And uh, God is good all the time. And I never, I can honestly say this, that I never worry about the money because. It's all God's, it's God's work. And God promised that he would always meet the needs of his people and of his works. So what you have to do is just keep on trusting God and do the Lord's work. Uh, some famous person years ago said this, the Lord's work done in the Lord's way will never lack the Lord's supply. That's true. I forget who said that, but it wasn't me. Uh, that's true. And, and so I can testify to that. Uh, and the, the attendance, by the way, has nothing to do with the offering. Did you know that? The, the numbers in the attendance has nothing to do with the offering, see? Um, that's why when evangelists come here, sometimes they're amazed at the generous love offerings that our church gives them because they, they go to church much bigger. They didn't get that amount of money. It has nothing to do with the crowd, the size of the crowd. It has everything to do with the size of the crowd's hearts. See, that's what it has to do with. And uh, so we thank the Lord for the way he blesses through you, and he'll bless you as you honor him. And I sincerely believe that. Now, we have a lot of folks uh, that we want to pray for today. Thank the Lord. Uh, Marty's wife, Judy's home from the hospital. Uh, they brought her home on Thursday. She's recovering at home. And uh, a lot of people are continuing to be sick, not only with the virus, but then there's a flu going around. My wife, Jeanette's caught that now. She's got the stomach flu, so she's sick at home. And uh, how many others have people that you are concerned about, uh, either sick or some other need that you want me to pray about this morning? All right, a lot of hands, and uh, we'll take those to the Lord together in prayer. Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you know all about this coming year. It doesn't catch you by surprise. You are the God of the eternal present. So we thank you for that. And we thank you that ever we have to face, whatever it is, that you're already there and you're waiting for us. And so we acknowledge your sovereignty and your lordship over all. And we praise you for your faithfulness in this past year. Uh, we pray for those who have recently had loved ones go home to be with you. Uh, pray for Laura and the Reitler family. Pray for Jackie Evoch and her family and the home going of her husband, Jim, and, and others here, I'm sure, in the church family that I may be forgetting that have lost loved ones either this year uh, in this holiday season or in past seasons. And it's a difficult time. So I pray that you'd comfort as you are able to do we know that you are the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort that you give us yourself. So help us to share with others that which you are doing in our lives so that they could be encouraged. I do pray for those that are sick today. Thank you for bringing Judy home from the hospital. We ask that you would just raise her up and completely heal her. Pray for my sister Ruth who's uh, just she and her husband Pete just recovered recovering in there from COVID in Kansas and all over the country and around the world I pray that you would uh, help people to recover I pray that uh, folks would realize and understand that 
there's not going to be a time when everything is down to zero that this is going to be something that uh, will drag on and on and people are going to have to learn how to adjust and live uh, in this environment and just be health conscious. We know that many people have the flu too. And some people die from the flu, so I pray for them. I pray for those that are sick. We also ask for those that are uh, sin sick. People are away from you. People are in rebellion, living their lives their own way. Uh, some of them claim to be Christians. I pray you draw them back to yourself. I pray that you do whatever it takes to wake them up and see, help them to see the, the wrong direction they're going. That they might repent, turn around, and go the other direction. And I ask for those that uh, are in need of a place to live. There are homeless people that uh, need help. There are people that need food, people that need clothing, people who need jobs. I thank you that you know each need. And you have promised that you will supply all of our needs. Our country has great needs. I pray that you would supply the needs of our country and help your people in your country to pray and seek your face and turn from their sins so that you might hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land, which desperately needs you. America needs God worse than it ever has before. Help us not to give in to fear. Help us not to let ourselves, our hearts be swayed in fear or discouragement or depression or defeat uh, as the news media continues to beat the drum of how many people are sick and how many people are in the hospital and how many people are dying. We sadly know that Satan wants to keep people in a state of fear. And so I pray that those that are God's people would recognize that deception of the devil and not he put their heads in the sand, but not, not give in to fear and recognize that you are able to protect us and keep us no matter what happens. And that it's going to get worse in the world as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ. So we thank you. Now, you are able to protect your people, and you are able to guard us from the wrath that's to come. I pray for the missionaries. We thank you for the generous offerings that we were able to send to those missionaries. Thank you for the generosity of your people. Pray that you would meet all the needs that your people have. Continue to help the missionaries as they serve you around the world. And then the men and women of the military, keep them safe and uh, bring them home safely to their families. Men and women in law enforcement, protect them as we're living in a lawless society that doesn't respect authority anymore. I pray that you would bring them home safely each night to their loved ones. And we ask that you would just work miraculously in people's hearts to help people to see that we're reaping the results of America turning its back on God. And so I pray, Father, today as we come to your word, that your Holy Spirit would encourage us with your word. We'd recognize that we're responsible for the things we can control. So help us to set our attention and focus our hearts and minds on those things we can do something about and to pray about all the other things. And so we give you praise and thanks for what you are doing and ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Give you a good testimony about the, my title today and about that scripture verse. Turn to Psalm 90 as, as I share this testimony. By the way, the outline is on the inside of the bulletin. If you have the Version Bible app, it's in the Version Bible app, okay? You just go in the Version Bible app, open it up. Go down to the bottom right and hit events, and you'll, you'll find Capital Bible Church. Once you've done that in your phone, it should come up automatically in events. And we put the bulletin in there through the help of one of our faithful volunteers. 
uh, each week. The reason I don't name our volunteers is because if I named them, whether it was for the bulletin or for the e-bulletin or whatever else, then people go to them and complain. Yeah. If you have a complaint, bring it to me. Or put it in that little one-inch box we have back there for complaints, okay, on the wall. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, that's people. If you dealt with, if you're, if you ever dealt with people in any of your businesses, you know what people are like. Here's the testimony. The volunteer that gets these videos, our worker, chose the video for today. Not, not that screen, but this one you watched, you know, that was about time and teach us the number of days. That was chosen weeks ago. I didn't know that was chosen for today. The, the volunteer didn't know that God had told me to preach this today, see? So that was just a really neat confirmation as I saw that, I always preview the PowerPoint on Wednesday afternoon to make sure it's as good as it can be for Sunday morning. And as I saw that, I went, wow, that's really cool. Because they didn't know I was going to preach on that. So let's talk about this a little bit and let's go look at the big idea. Because the big idea you are going to resist. The big idea you are not going to believe. The big idea, however, is true. And so I want you to say it a couple times with me out loud, okay? I have enough time to do everything God wants me to do. Say it again. I have enough time to do everything God wants me to do. One more time. I have enough time to do everything God wants me to do. Now, if you find that hard to believe, what that means is this. That means that there are some things that are cluttering right now your time. I'm not being critical. I'm just helping you understand. If you find this, this statement hard to believe that you don't have enough time, well, then there's, there's a problem, and we'll talk about it today in the, in the message. But one of the biggest problems that we all have is clutter. And it's not, not just with stuff, see? It's, it's clutter of our time, clutter of what we do, okay? And we'll get into it in just a moment, all right? Now imagine, before we get into the first point, imagine this. Imagine that there is a bank that credits your account each morning. This is pretend, boys and girls, young people. Each morning, this bank gives you, credits your account with $86,400. And the next day, it's gone. It doesn't carry over to the next day. So every evening, deletes whatever part of that balance you failed to use during the day. What would you do with that $86,400? to keep from losing it, you, you would draw it out. Yeah, there's no restriction on that, by the way. You could draw it out, see, and you would. Every one of us have such a bank. Its name is time. Every morning, it credits each one of us with 86,400 seconds. Every night, it writes off as lost Whatever this, you have failed to invest to good purpose. It carries over no balance. In other words, like the cell phone companies used to say before they got to the unlimited deals, you know, there's no rollover minutes with God, okay? No rollover minutes with God. There's no overdraft. Each day it opens a new account for you. Each night it burns the remains of the day. Some of you are wondering, why does he keep that phone on the, on the pulpit? I keep it on here in case you have a question about the sermon you want to ask me. You can text it to me, and if I know the answer, I'll give it to you, all right? That's why. Each night, the bank burns the remains of the day. If you fail to use the day's deposit, the loss is yours. There's no drawing against the tomorrow. You must live in the present on today's 
deposits. The clock is running. You have to invest it to get the most from it in health, happiness, and success. Make the most of today. People live by the clock because time is important to all of us. Benjamin Franklin said, do not squander time, for it is the stuff life is made of. Now, there are a lot of frustrated people, and you may or may not be one of them, who seem to always fight the clock habitually as a way of life. They stay up late, then they sleep as late as they can, and then they rush frantically to school or work, gulping down an unhealthy breakfast on the way in the car, applying their makeup or using a razor at the stoplight, talking on their phone at the same time. As I study Jesus' life, I'm amazed. Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry. Although he was doing the most important job in history, redeeming the world, and although he knew he only had a few years to do it, he never ran. He made time to consider the flowers and the birds of the air. He had time to put his hands on the little children and bless them. Time was his friend. Now, the Bible gives us some great insights into how you can make time your friend rather than your enemy. And here's the good news, as you heard me say in my prayer. Basically, God exists in a realm that's not bound by time or space. God doesn't wear a Rolex or even a Timex. God doesn't have a planner. He doesn't have a smartphone. Okay? He doesn't need it. He's the creator of time, and he's greater than time. So the first step in making your time your friend is to totally immerse yourself in God. Now, in Psalm 90, we read these words. And I'm going to ask in reverence to the Word of God, if you would stand with me, please, while I read Psalm 90 from a modern translation. You can follow along in your Bible if you have one there. Could we stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word? Psalm 90, starting in verse 1. Lord, you have been our home since the beginning. Before the mountains were born and before you created the earth and the world, you are God. You have always been and you will always be. You turn people back into dust. You say, go back into dust, human beings. To you, a thousand years is like the passing of a day or like a few hours in the night. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear or like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning they are fresh and new, but by evening they dry up and die. Our lifetime, verse 10, is 70 years, or if we're strong, 80 years. But the years are full of hard work and pain. They pass quickly, and then we are gone. Who knows the full power of your anger? Your anger is as great as our fear of you should be. Teach us how short our lives really are so that we may grow in wisdom. Thank you very much. God always adds his blessing to the reading publicly of his word. You may be seated. Now, we're going to take the four letters in the word time to help us learn its importance. All right? So there in your bulletin, you have those four words. Treasure, invest, manage, enjoy. Treasure, invest, manage, enjoy, and then leave yourself some space at the bottom because I'm going to give you a, uh, a bonus since you came today, all right? Psalm 90, 12, teach us to number our days. We may gain a heart of wisdom. God says we should treasure time as a valuable commodity. Now, you and I number our years, or at least some of us do, but God says every day is so precious, we should treasure it and realize it. Number it. So, let's talk about values on time. To, to realize the value of one year, ask a student who failed a grade. To realize the value of one month, ask a mother who gave birth to a premature baby. How valuable is an hour? Ask the businessman whose flight was delayed an hour and he missed an important business deal. How valuable is one minute? Ask the man who had a heart attack in the restaurant and an EMT happened to be sitting at the next table and CPR saved his life. How valuable is a second? Ask the person who barely missed a head-on with an oncoming car. How valuable is a millisecond? Ask the Olympic swimmer who missed qualifying by six tenths. See, time really is valuable. 
So we need to learn a couple of things about what this means for our families. We need to treasure, treasure every moment that we have. Yesterday is history, right? Yesterday is history. Can you change history? No. You can try to reinvent it. That's what they're doing with America. But you can't change it, see? History is yesterday. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is not history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Tomorrow is a mystery. It may or may not come, right? Yeah. The Bible says we have no promise of tomorrow. Matthew 6, 34, take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the trouble thereof. So tomorrow is a mystery. Yesterday is history. Today is a gift. Today is a gift. That's why it's called what? The present. Yeah. That's why it's called the present. Today is a gift. Now, here's what's sad. What's sad to me is that I had to live a long time and almost die before I got smart enough to wake up every morning and thank God for the present of the new day. I'll confess that to you. It wasn't until I, you know, was in the hospital and, you know, on oxygen and I realized, wow, you know. And, of course, before that I had some surgeries where I could have died if they hadn't gotten it in time. So from that time on, <clears throat> I, I'm not saying this braggingly because it shouldn't have taken me this long to figure it out, okay? But, but every morning, every single morning, when Jeanette and I pray together, and I try not to leave the house till we prayed together, every single morning when we pray together, in my prayer, as I begin, I thank God for, for safe night's sleep, and then I thank him for a new day for life and breath, for my health, for strength, for the fact that I think I'm still in my right mind. I can talk and walk, okay? Yeah. Now, see, I, I used to take all that for granted. I did. And that's not smart. It's not good. Because when you do that, then you're not, you're not really aware of how precious it is. Hey, that's, that's the reason why it's not good to, to neglect that. You don't understand then, because of your hurry, how precious every moment is. But it's a gift. And nobody's guaranteed the next minute. Nobody's guaranteed. I could drop over of a heart attack in the next minute. So could you, even though you may not have that in your history. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic. I'm just saying nobody is guaranteed, right? And sadly, in my lifetime, I have buried many people who are much younger than me, not just like Laura's dear mother, 91, but I've buried people who are 49, okay? I bury people who are 16. So it doesn't matter. The age doesn't matter. So young people are foolish if you think only old people die. So right now, the present is what God's given us. And we need to value it highly and treasure it. You can make more money, but you can't make more time. Did you ever think of that? You can make more money, but you can't make more time. Have you ever heard the expression, time is money? That's not true. It's not true. Time is much more valuable than money. It may be hard to make more money, but it can be done. It's totally impossible to make more time. You can't do that. Time is more valuable than money. A.W. Tozer wrote this, this statement. And by the way, if you ever find a book by A.W. Tozer, you should buy it. He's an excellent, excellent writer. Time is a resource. 
that is non-renewable and non-transferable. You cannot store it up, slow it up, hold it up, divide it up, or give it up. You can't hoard it up or save it for a rainy day. When it's lost, it's unrecoverable. When you kill time, remember that it has no resurrection, end quote. So we need to understand we should treasure time as the most valuable asset you're given in the world. Okay? And the next letter in time, of course, is the word is the letter I. I. Invest. You can't buy more time and you can't really find more time. We talk about making time, but you can't do that either. You can't save time, you can only invest it. You can't save time, you can only invest it. Time is more valuable than money, but it's like money in that it can be spent and invested. It's different from money, though, because while money can be saved, time can't. If you don't use it, you lose it forever. In the early 1970s, Jim Croce wrote a song. Some of you will remember. And the song said, if I could save time in a bottle, the first thing that I'd like to do is save every day till eternity passes away just to spend them with you. Now, those may be great lyrics, and it would be nice if we could save time, but you can't. In fact, a few months after Croce wrote that song, he was tragically killed in a plane crash in Natchitoches, Louisiana, at the age of 30. You can't save time. Now, we, we like to think we could do that. We have all kinds of time-saving appliances, you know, like microwave ovens. And we're in such a hurry, we think that takes too long, don't we, sometimes? Yeah. And computers. We get mad because it takes forever sometimes for the thing to boot up, right? A lot of guys, when they're driving, like to take shortcuts in order to, quote, save time. All right, I have a question for you. Show me some of the time you've saved. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. You know, I, I used to, when we were, Jeanette and I were traveling a lot, I used to, on the turnpike, used to lament, or on the interstate, I used to lament having to get off to make a pit stop for gas or food or, you know, whatever else. Uh, because I'd think, man, all those cars I just passed, they're going to get past me again, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's how dumb we men are, okay? You ladies, I'm sure, never thought like that, but, you know, men do. And sometimes it's funny, I'd get back on, and down the road always, I'd, I'd see that car. They must have stopped somewhere, too, see? It doesn't matter. That's the reality, see? At a graduation commencement at his alma mater, Wheaton College, Billy Graham said these words, time is the capital that God has given us to invest. People, now listen to this, this is pretty good. <clears throat> People are the stocks in which we are to invest our time, whether they are blue chips or penny stocks or even junk bonds. <laughs> yeah. Time is the capital, and people are the stocks in which we are to invest. Time, Carl Sandburg said, time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have, and only you can determine how it will be spent. Be careful lest you let other people spend it for you. When I was growing up on the wall of our house, there was a scripture principle motto that my parents had. And you've heard it often before, perhaps, if you grew up in that, that kind of Christian home. Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. See, where you invest your time reveals what's most important to you. Where you invest, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If time's your treasure, where you invest it, that's where your heart is. 
Now, I like the way Eugene Peterson put it in the message. The message is not a translation, it's a paraphrase. That's why I chose to put that on the screen to show you that, so, so you know it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase, all right? Here's what he says in the, par in the message. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. So there are 168 golden hours in every week, 168. The average person will spend about 56 of those hours sleeping, about 24 of those hours in eating and personal hygiene, and about 50 of those hours working or traveling to work. That means there are only about 35 hours a week of, quote, discretionary time left over. That's about five hours today. So where are you investing those hours? Now, if somebody could follow you around and observe you for those five hours, after about 10 days, they could tell you what's most important in your life. You know that? Yeah. You might not like it or agree with it, but some of you, they would say that surfing the internet or being on Facebook or Instagram is most important to you. For other people, it would be watching television or reading magazines. doing a hobby. Well, that's fine. Here's a question, though. How much of that discretionary time are you devoting to the Lord? A lot of people, they, when they're asked about their quiet time, you know, which quiet time means you, you make time each day to some time in the day to read the Bible. You take time to read the Bible and talk to God, let God talk to you through his word, you speak to God in prayer, and then you listen for what God's gonna say to you. That's called a quiet time, okay? A lot of people say to me when we talk about this, oh yeah, I know I should do that, I need to have one, but I just don't have time. That's, that's bogus. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm so, you don't like my telling you this, but it's bogus, that's, that's garbage. We have time to do whatever we want to do. We have time to stay up if we want to late at night to watch a football game when next year it's not going to even matter. We have time for whatever, okay? And I don't care what you do with your time. I'm just saying to you, don't ever say you don't have time to read God's Word or pray. What, what you really mean is, and people need to get honest with themselves, see? What you really mean is that I won't take the time to do it. I don't want to because other things are more important to me. That's the reality, okay? And, and thankfully, God doesn't treat us like we treat him or we'd all be in a mess. You know that? That's right. How much time are you giving to your family? A study of 1,500 households at the University of Michigan found mothers working outside the home spend an average of 11 minutes a day on weekdays and 30 minutes a day on weekends with the children, not including mealtimes. Fathers spend an average of eight minutes a day on weekdays, 14 minutes a day on weekends in different activities with their children. Have you ever heard this excuse? Some dad or mom will say, oh, I don't spend much time with my family, but the little time I do spend is quality time. <laughs> I probably used that in the past in my life. Well, that's a lousy phrase. It's usually used as an excuse for not spending much time together. And quality time is really a misnomer because here's why. All time has the same quanti quality, all time, all right? Consider this second. Okay, 1,001. Was that second of higher quality than this second? 1,002. No, see? All the seconds are of the same value. All times of the same value. It's like talking about quality money. If I offered you a $100 bill and it was old and wrinkled, would you say, oh, no, that's, that's wrinkled. I'd rather have that new crisp $5 bill. See, it's better quality. The paper's better quality, see. 
No, see, that's ridiculous. Now, what people mo usually mean is some meaningful family time, okay? That's what people mean, meaningful family time, but there's no excuse for investing a large quality, quantity of time with your family, no substitute, see? If they're important to you, you'll indicate it by the amount of discretionary time you give them. Next letter in time is M, M, which stands for manage. Manage. Ephesians 5, 15 says, be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise. Redeem the time, make the most of every opportunity. Let me share with you this great illustration. All the money we receive comes from God and we only manage it. That's true also of our time. God is the creator of time. He alone controls it. A time management expert was teaching a seminar to executives. He placed a large, clear, open mouth jar in front of the group. Next, he put seven or eight large rocks into the jar until it was full. Is the jar full, he asked the executives. Everyone nodded. Then he took pebbles and he filled up the jar with the small rocks until they reached the rim. Is the jar full? By now they didn't answer. So he poured fine sand in around the pebbles and rocks. Is the jar full now? Some nodded. Then he proceeded to take a pitcher of water and fill up the jar again. Is the jar full now? And they didn't know what to say. Then he asked this question. What's the lesson here about time management? And a hand shot up and they all said this, they all agreed. Here's the lesson. No matter how busy you are, they said you can always fit more things into your schedule. Wrong, he replied. Wrong. The lesson is, unless you put the big rocks in first, they never will fit in. You must figure out what the big rocks are for you. What are the big rocks in your life? Giving time to God, giving time to your marriage, to your children, to your grandchildren. If you don't put those big rocks in first, someone else will fill up your jar. See, we need to understand a couple things. Number one, every moment is a gift from God that must be managed wisely. Every moment is a gift from God that must be managed wisely. There's a field of study called, course called time management, and that's a hot topic, but in his book written years ago, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey writes these words, time management is a misleading concept. You can't really manage time. You can't delay it, speed it up, save it, or lose it. No matter what you do, time keeps moving forward at the same rate. The challenge is not to manage time, but to manage ourselves. Ooh. That's convicting, isn't it? It's kind of like stress. You know what causes stress? I can tell you exactly. What causes stress is when we try to control things that are outside of our control. Hmm. Yeah. You try to control your, you know, somebody else. You can't control another person. We barely can control ourselves, but that's what we can control. Right? But we stress ourselves out when we, when we take responsibility for things that are not our responsibility or try to control things that we can't control, see? Now, we manage ourselves, not time. That's why God says in Ephesians 5, redeem the time, make the most of every opportunity for doing good. Now, right now we're in a huge big football um, smorgasbord, buffet for all the football fanatics. And for all the wives that are enduring it, just be patient because after January 10th, it all goes away, all right? But here's a good illustration that I liked, I, I read up from Emmett Smith. He was a great football running back. 
He was not the biggest or the fastest or the strongest. What he, excelled, what he excelled at was running with his eyes open and being the best at seeing holes in the line as they opened and then running through them. Running through the holes in the defensive line, seeing the holes and just zipping in, okay, getting through. And it might only be there for a second, a moment, but he saw it and he got through. That's the way we should live. Looking for every opportunity to invest time wisely, then darting through them. When an opportunity passes, it can't be reclaimed. It's gone forever. That's what it means to redeem time. And watch this. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to help you so you don't feel bad tomorrow, okay? I bet you if I ask, how many of you ever felt like God was saying to you at a moment in time in a restaurant or in a, in a store or somewhere, speak to that person? You should say something to that person. Or you should call this person up. Or you should write this person a, a note. Or you should send this person a text, okay? You have that fleeting thought that God wants you to do that. And, and unfortunately, it's like that little hole in the line that Emmett Smith sees. It's not there for long, see? Especially if it's a person that you interact with. The person may be gone, and you missed the opportunity. And you knew at that moment that you should say a word, see? That's what it means to redeem the time. It means to be watching always with your eyes and ears open for opportunities to speak a word of encouragement, a word of kindness, a word of love, a word of faith, a word of hope. Because today people are, people are scared to death, and it's being whipped up constantly by the news media, all right? And if you have a word of hope or encouragement, you, can, you, you never will really fully realize how much that means to some person when you give it, okay? Number two, if you don't manage your time, someone else will manage it for you. Some people complain they don't have enough time to spend with their families. You've got exactly the same amount of time as everyone else. The most important time you'll invest will be in your family. Many of you remember the song, The Cat's in the Cradle by Harry Chapin. Part of it says this, my child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. He was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he said, I'm going to be like you, dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball. Now, come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today. I've got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away and he smiled. And he said, you know, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. The final verse says, I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been real nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Now, maybe you heard that song, but here's the rest of the story. Harry Chapin's wife, Sandy, actually wrote the words to that song after their son Josh was born, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. When their son was seven, Harry was performing 200 concerts a year, and Sandy asked him when he was going to take some time to be with his son. Harry promised to make some time at the end of the summer, but he never made it. That summer, a truck hit Harry's Volkswagen bug, and he was instantly killed. The final letter in time is E, enjoy. Enjoy. The time you spend with your family should be enjoyable. It should be the best time of your life. Here's a couple of ways to enjoy family time. Say no to family time robbers. Say no to family, family time robbers. There'll always be something else to do. There'll always be somewhere else you can be. But if we're going to make spending time with our family a priority, you have to learn the power of the little word no. 
You, under, you have to understand that when you say yes to family time, you've already said no to everything else. But many dads and moms allow interruptions and other demands to detract from their family time. A thousand years from now, what's going to be more important? Spending time with your family or watching some TV show or being on your phone? Nobody on their deathbed said, I ever wish I, wish I had spent more time at work. Several years ago, Ken Griffey Jr., world-famous baseball player, was invited to the Players' Choice Awards, where he was to be awarded the Player of the Decade Award. That's a big deal. On national TV, he beat out players like Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire. But when he found out when the award was to be given, he declined to attend. He had something more important to do. His five-year-old son, Trey, was playing in his first baseball game, and Ken wasn't going to miss it. Wow. That says a whole lot more about him than all the uh, honors and records that he beat in the game of baseball. We need to learn to say no to some of the things that take us away from our family. And by the way, what I had learned the hard way was people always would ask me if I could do this or that, the other thing, you know. And... I had to learn that, just like for many, many men that work in business, you write stuff in your appointment book, you know? So I found that if I would write in my family, then I have an appointment, okay? So I would write in the family, write in Jeanette, write in whatever, okay? And if somebody would ask me if I could do something on this particular time, now I'm not talking about life-threatening thing. I'm just talking about, you know, I'd say, well, I'm sorry, I can't. I have an appointment. Right? Because my family is more important than what anybody else wants me to do, right? And if we don't let them know that, then they're not going to know it any other way. Say yes to happy memories. Say yes to happy memories. Here's an illustration of a happy memory. An old man was up in his attic, going through boxes of photo albums. He was looking for a picture. When he came on a journal, his now adult son had kept. Opening the yellowed pages, he glanced over a short reading, his lips curved in an unconscious smile. Even his eyes brightened. As he read the words that smoke sweet and clear to his soul, it was the voice of the little boy who had grown up too fast in this very house, whose voice had grown fainter and fainter over the years. In the utter silence of the attic, the words of a guileless six-year-old worked their magic, carried the old man back to a time almost totally forgotten. Entry after entry stirred a sentimental hunger in his heart, like the longing a gardener feels in the winter for the fragrance of spring flowers. But it was accompanied by the painful memory that his son's simple recollections of those days were far different from his own. But how different? Reminded that he had kept the daily journal of his business activities over the year, he closed his son's journal and turned to leave, having forgotten the cherished photo that originally triggered his search. Hunched over to keep from bumping his head on the rafters, the old man stepped to the wooden stairway, made his descent, then headed down a carpeted stairway that led to the, to the den, the office. Opening a glass cabinet door, he reached in and pulled out an old business journal. Turning, he sat down at the desk and placed the two journals side by side. His was leather-bound and engraved neatly with his name in gold, while his son's was tattered and the name Jimmy had been nearly scuffed from its surface. He ran a long skinny finger over the letters as though he could restore what had been worn away with time and use. As he opened his journal, the old man's eyes fell upon an inscription that stood out because it was so brief in comparison to the other. In his own neat handwriting were these words, Wasted the whole day fishing with Jimmy. Didn't catch a thing. With a deep sigh and a shaking hand, he took Jimmy's journal and found the little boy's entry for the same day, June the 4th. Large, scrawling letters pressed deeply into the paper read, went fishing with my dad, best day of my life. James 4.14, how do you know? What will happen tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. 
It's here a little while and then gone. Now, you want to really make that come home to you? Then I, I challenge you to say these words that I'm going to give you out loud. I may not have much time to live. Say that. I may not have much time to live. That's what that verse says, right? Our life is like a vapor. Appears for a little time and is gone. See? Now, let me give you a practical re- re- recommendation because you might say, well, that's, this sermon is like a downer, man. All you did is fill me up with guilt. That's not the purpose, okay? All right, now listen. Here's a practical recommendation to help. And there's been a whole book and probably books written about it, but Henry Townsend wrote a book called Margins, all right? So here's the practical recommendation. Add, add some margin to your life. See, a lot of people are on overload, headed for a crash. And almost every week I get, I get reports of somebody that had a nervous breakdown. Let's consider these statistics. We spend eight months of our lives opening junk mail. Two years of our lives playing phone tag with people who are busy or not answering. Five years waiting for people who are trying to do too much or late for meetings. We have much technology or easily accessible yet still not succeeding in saving time. We all need to learn where the off button is on our cell phones. We're a pile on stretch to the limit society, chronically rushed, chronically late, chronically exhausted. And we feel like Job did when he said I was not in safety. I was not in safety. Neither did I have rest. Neither was I quiet. Yet trouble came. It keeps coming. So here's the deal, folks. Overload comes when we have too much activity in our lives. Overload comes. Simply put, we're stressed by the pace of life. The solution, put some margin into your life. What's margin? Margin is breathing room. It's keeping a little reserve you're not using up. It's not going from one meeting to the next with no space in between. Margin is the space between your load and your limit. Hopefully your load is not heavier than your limits. But the truth is, most of us are far more overloaded than we can handle. And there's no margin for error in our lives. Marginless is being 30 minutes late to the doctor's office because you were 20 minutes late getting out of the hairdresser because you were 10 minutes late dropping the turn off at school because something unexpected came up and ruined your perfectly timed out plan. That's marginless. A good plan leaves some margin, some room for error. Margin, this is good. Margin is having breath Breath at the top of the staircase, money at the end of the month, and sanity left over at the end of each day. Margin less is not having time to finish the book you're reading on stress. Margin is having the time to read it twice. Very quickly, four benefits of putting margin in your life. Here we go. Four benefits. Peace. When you're not hurrying and worrying all the time, you have time to think, time to relax, time to enjoy life. Better health. Unrelenting stress harms our bodies. We all know that, yet we let it continue day after day. Many times, the only time we get margin in our lives is when the heart attack almost happens or does happen, or the blood pressure skyrockets. Why do we wait till our health plummets before we make this decision? The truth is your body needs downtime in order to heal. This is another whole sermon, but I'll quickly give you this line, okay? It's fact. This is fact. Your body needs at least one day out of seven to not work, to rest, okay? And that's a command from God. God said six days you should labor and do all your work. Take one day off, okay? And I, I've preached whole sermons on Sabbath. And not, we're not talking about what, what day you worship on Saturday, Sunday. We're talking about a, a rest day, a down day. The manufacturer says you need it. Re- race cars make pit stops occasionally in order to get repaired. You can't fix anything going 200 miles an hour. 
Yet we try to be repaired while we're racing through life. Margin builds in time for better health. Stronger relationships. Lack of margin is one big reason for the collapse of the American family today. When we don't make relationships a priority and make time for each other, our relationships suffer. Here's the truth. Relationships take time. Margin provides the time to sit and talk, to listen and enjoy one another, and provide the comfort we each need. By the way, please don't ever fail, and I'm, I'm not asking for more work here. I'm just trying to help you help me, okay? Don't ever fail to tell me something because you say to yourself, well, he's probably busy. <laughs> People tell me that all the time. I say, why don't, you tell, why don't you call me? Oh, I was afraid you would be busy. Well, here's the sad fact, folks. I can't remember a time in my life when I wasn't busy, and I can't imagine a time in my life when I won't be busy, but I'm not too busy for people, okay? I'm not. I'll make time. And I did look up that Psalm 148.4. Yeah. There's... There's thousands of people. I'll just give you this. If you're looking, if, if maybe you're a single person and you don't have any people to spend time with as a family anymore, your kids are grown up and gone, and you're by yourself, I'm going to tell you this. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people living in retirement communities and nursing homes and other places who have no one at all to talk to. And you don't need to have any kind of degree. You don't need to have any kind of training. All you need to do is just be willing to say, hey, how you doing? Would you like to talk? And trust me, you could, you could use as much time as you give them to be a blessing to people just by listening. You don't have to tell them anything. And by the way, here's a clue. Here's an amazing thing for you. When you're all done listening and left, you know what they'll tell somebody else? Well, that person made me feel really good. That really helped me a lot. And you didn't tell them anything. You just listened. Usefulness in ministry. See, when you're, only, when you're overloaded by activity, you can only think of yourself. You're in survival mode, trying to make it through another day. Being available to God for His use makes all the difference in the world. When you have no margin in your life, when God taps you on the shoulder and says, I'd like you to do this for me, your first response is not joy. Your first response is, oh no, another thing to do. Sorry, God, I'd like to do that. I'm just too busy. We end up resenting the great opportunities God brings into our lives. When you have margin, you're available for God to use. You don't have to live on overload. You don't have to live in survival mode. Start today to build a buffer around your schedule. Then enjoy the benefits of margin. I have enough time to do everything God wants me to do. Listen to what Jesus said. How, how many years did Jesus live? 33. This is an amazing statement in light of that. Jesus said to his father, this is a quote from John 17, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And by the way, that work was redeeming you saving your soul from an eternal hell. Jesus finished the work. Now, if you have not accepted what Jesus did yet for you on the cross when he died for you, then I invite you to do it today. And I invite you to ask God to help you as a Christian to say, Father, what are the big rocks in my life? What do you want me to do? What could I do for you in the time I have left? By the way, no matter what your job is for vocation, occupation, you never retire from serving God. I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm just talking about serving the Lord, okay? You never retire. You don't ever read in the Bible about God saying to somebody, okay, now you're 80 years old. Okay, forget it. I can't use you anymore, okay? People served the God, served the Lord until he called them home. 
And we're not talking, I'm talking about vaca- vocation, not talking about that. I'm not talking about what you get paid to do. I'm talking about just your life of serving God by serving others. See? By being a blessing. God has a work plan for you to do. And he wants to help you do it if you'll make yourself available to him. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer, please. With, with our eyes closed, let me ask you this question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Do you have eternal life? Have you accepted Jesus' finished work on the cross? When he died on the cross, he said it's finished. And he meant not his life, but his work for God. He had paid the price for sin. He had paid the penalty for our sins. Now we have to receive it, believe it, and act upon it. If you've never acted upon it, but you'd like to do that today, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just pray simply from your heart to God. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I repent of my sins, and I accept Jesus now as my Savior and Lord. Come into my life, make me your child, and help me live my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, God heard you, and I believe he saved you. I'd like to thank him for doing that if you'll let me. If you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago, would you lift your hand right now in the room? in the church building. If you're online, thank you. God bless you. If you're online, let us know by email or text. Christian friend, let me ask you a question. If God's Holy Spirit spoke into your heart today about, about your time, your use of time, maybe there's some things that you've been wanting to do, but you just didn't know how to make the time or manage or, or invest it. And you'd say, Pastor Bill, the Lord spoke to me today about some things he wants me to do Pray for me that I'll find the way to do it with his help. Would you lift your hand if that's what you are feeling right now as the Holy Spirit spoken to you? Yes, thank you very much. All over the audience. Heavenly Father, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that you're long-suffering with us. So I pray right now for these dear folks who want to serve you. Show them what they can do for you and how they can do it, how they can schedule their lives for maximum purpose and fulfillment. And continue to use us, I pray, for your honor and glory until Jesus Christ comes back. And we'll thank you and ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. As the praise team comes to the platform, let me mention that in the next month, I'd like to have a baptism here at the church and a membership class. There are sign-up sheets on the back table. So if you need baptism, uh, you can put your name on that list. I'll be glad to speak with you about that. If you, uh, what we'll do is we'll schedule the service when we have a couple people that are ready to be baptized. If you'd like to attend the class, uh, membership class, that's requirement to join the church is attend the class. And in that class, we explain all of the things that our church is about. Um, it's at 920. It's a one hour class. And we'll, we'll schedule that as soon as we have a couple of people. Let's stand together, please. Wednesday night, we have Awana again, so we'll be tearing down the back of the auditorium. I'll be teaching Bible study on end-time prophecies. That's at, that's at 630 in room 114 down the hall. You're invited to attend that. Here's a great song based on Matthew 633. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the Shall be given. 
if you're an adult, uh, we have an adult Bible class at 920 every Sunday morning. Uh, Reverend Artie Parlin here, one of our uh, missionaries that we support, is uh, happy to teach that class. He and his wife, Jean, uh, are here in our church. They've been here for 25 years, but they're able to attend now because he's not on the road. And uh, he teaches that class in room 114. They'd love to have you in the class Sunday morning. We don't have uh, teen adult Sunday school, teen children Sunday school classes yet. We'd like to as soon as we get some workers, all right? So if your Lord lays it on your heart to teach children, let us know that. Just like we'd like to get children's church started up again. Two more announcements. Christmas cards are in the mailboxes, and tomorrow night we'll tear all this down. So if you can come out at 6 o'clock, help us undeck the halls. We'll buy a couple of pizzas so you don't have to make supper, and uh, we'll tear all this down, put it back upstairs for another year. All right? Let's, let's pray together now the Lord's Prayer and think about the words of this prayer Jesus gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. You're